Today we've got a great malicious compliance story all about thinking about what you want. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, okay, I'll work my duty time. I'll change the names to protect my job. A bit of background, I've worked in public education at site for over 25 years. The supervisor was a new one with a questionable past. I was newly elected union president. The supervisor did not like me and I think felt threatened by my mere existence and went after me. Wrong move, Skippy. From the beginning of the educational term, my supervisor, ND, and I clashed. They seemed to go out of their way to find something to talk with me about, ride me up for, or simply question me about. At first, I chalked it up as trying to figure out what I did and how things ran, but it became obvious that it was going after me and wanting me to get fired. Well, let's just say, as a long-term employee in a public education system with a strong union, I am fairly protected. Add to that, I am the union president of that strong union. Add Kevlar to that protection. That is not to say I could not lose my job, it just needed to be criminal and a felony. I will try to keep the rest of the story short. After multiple petty meetings, conference summaries, and write-ups, I got tired of it. I started to push back and I would not talk, even in public spaces, to ND. They were invisible to me. I did not hear them, I did not talk with them. In fact, I would ask someone to give them a message while I was standing in front of them. Needless to say, this made them frustrated. If they wanted to talk with me, there was always another person from the union in the room with me. On one occasion, aka fishing expositions, my reply was, I will not answer that questions with my attorney present. And no, it was not an investigation of criminal nature. Supervisor kept rephrasing the questions, hoping I would slip up or answer. Nope, I am smarter than you. I answered the questions that did not answer supervisor's intended path, but would not answer the questions he wanted to nail me for. This made him so frustrated that he started to threaten my job and reassign me. Nope, Skippy, you cannot do that. He sent me a directive that I was to check in with his assistant each morning, check out for my lunch, and then back in, and then check out each day. If the assistant was not present, I was directed to text both the supervisor and the assistant if I was away from my desk. I was also instructed to only work my duty time and I could not work outside my day. Okay, not a problem. Each morning I would walk past supervisor's office and check in. Every time I had to go to the copier, I would text them both. Every time I used the restroom, I would text them both. Every time I had to talk with someone away from my desk, I texted them. This got fun quickly. If I got called into a meeting by the dean or other higher administration, I told them I was not allowed away from my desk, office, classroom without supervisor's permission and that they needed to call him to get that permission. Needless to say, I was following the directive to the letter and blowing things up with a smile. This lasted about two weeks before the dean and others started to get annoyed by the actions and directive of supervisor. The increased pressure upon supervisor became increased pressure on me. Yep, he was not getting the message and digging his heels in because he's the boss and I was just a subordinate. When I was fed up, I brought in the regional union representative and they started to get very clear with not only supervisor, but the president of the educational institution that the next meeting would involve the union attorneys and we would be filing legal action under the state and federal laws in regard to union busting. Big dollars and attorney fees to even start to answer the complaint. By the way, it costs us nothing for our attorneys in filing. To make a long story short, my life got much easier. He was not allowed to talk with me and he was placed on administrative leave for the remainder of the year and never returned to educational employment in the area. And for me, life is great and I'm happy to work more hours than I'm paid for and I do not need to text anyone when I have to pee. Winner! Although in some circumstances unions can be toxic or actually working against the workers in some cases depending on who's in control of it, generally stories like this is why I'm very pro-union, I don't understand why you wouldn't be. Also hi, I'm Steven and if you guys enjoy awesome stories of malicious compliance, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below. That said, our next story is One Lights Off? Sure. I'm new to Reddit and English is not my main language. I'm in a car driving on Balkan roads, so I'll probably have misspellings and I'll put my text in chat GBT. You'll probably fix mistakes. I'm in an IT course in one Balkan country and we got an offer to go to one summer sports camp. Many of us agreed and it was great fun. We were in small rooms of 10 to 14 people. I think there was a room with 16, but I can't confirm. 
When I say small, I mean just enough room for six to eight double beds, space to get to the beds, and a bathroom. The camp was great, but if you wanted to find something you didn't like, it wouldn't be hard. However, we had such a great time that we ignored most of those things. There was one rule that we had a problem with, lights off at 11. Now, the rule's okay for kids, but we were between 16 and 20 years old in my room. Also, most activities that the camp organized itself finished after 11, which caused a problem because 12 boys needed to prepare for bed in the dark. The only light source we could use was in the bathroom, which would light up maybe a fourth of the room, and after, half of it was pure darkness again. We complained, but they said to use flashlights from our phones. It was impractical, but somehow working, until one of my friends and I were talking about the issue during the day and I jokingly said, why don't we use tape that my friend bought? We all brought a lot of random stuff like that. He actually thought it was a great idea. We talked to all the roommates and two of them even had flashlights. We asked the camp organizer if we could tape our phones and flashlights on the walls and windows so we could see better, and he said, whatever. That night, we taped 12 phones with flashlights and two batteries on the windows and turned them all on to look outside. It wasn't as bright as we expected, but enough for anyone passing by that sector to notice. Two of our teachers passed by, one was trying to understand what was going on, and the second one, I found out later, knew what we planned and couldn't believe we actually did it. Then the director came by and he just asked, what the heck did you do? When we explained, he told us that he wasn't actually surprised. Then camp workers started showing up, the same one who told us the first time to just use phones. In his defense, he was following rules from above and told us we hadn't broken any rules, but the organizer would not be happy. The next day, all phones were dead and one battery was surprisingly still holding. Some sort of higher ups talked to us and he thought it was funny. The rule has changed and now lights off is at midnight for older groups. I would just think 100% if you're doing an activity that doesn't finish until 11 or after it, that you should be exempt from this lights off rule, at least for an extra hour when you get back. Is it not kind of moronic for them to not realize that? This next story is, you should think about what you want. Okay. I used to be a firefighter for a volunteer department. The town was small and nothing happened on most days. But I was young and single and I loved the job. I showed up every single time I could. The only person who was there more than me was the chief. As many volunteer firefighters know, when grandma falls down at 3 a.m., you get one or two people. But if there's a fire, people you haven't seen in months suddenly have enough time to show up. Anyway, that department was a mess. People were always talking crap and backstabbing. Training was a joke. You were lucky to get a PowerPoint once a week. Stuff was stolen often, there was once a whole political coup for some reason, somebody really wanted power in a small town department in the middle of nowhere. I learned it was best to just stay quiet and do my job. And that was helped when I went to night shifts in my real job. I was working 12 plus hour shifts, sometimes 5 or 6 days a week. I still showed up to every run I could, but after 7 years there, I was just done with it all. Everything came to a head when I was scheduled 28 12-hour shifts out of a 30-day month. I was still the second most active member out of 30 people, but I wasn't kissing the appropriate butts and the management kept trying to get me in trouble. They once threatened to fire me for not turning in some paperwork and I had to point out that paperwork had been sitting in their mailbox for 3 days. They eventually decided to add a stupid new rule. You were now required to sit at the station for 40 unpaid hours a month. Not doing so could lead to discipline and termination. I didn't bother. I was about 24 shifts into the month and I did not care about their dumb rule. But I realized that I could make it, so I left work, grabbed a change of clothes, and I went to the department. It was about noon, which was midnight to me since I worked nights. I tried to sleep on the rock-hard beds they provided. Not 30 minutes went by when the training officer kicked the door in and demanded that I get up and help with training. My role? I sat on a hose so it didn't move while somebody else practiced the pump controls. A sandbag could have done just as well. An hour later, training finished and I tried to go back to sleep. I was told off again. I ended up hiding in the TV room so I could have some peace and quiet. They found me again and wrote me up, first time in years, for what amounted to not being enthusiastic enough about the job. I endured a lecture while trying not to fall asleep where I stood. I finally got to go sit down when I got a text from the boss at my real job. They wanted me to work that night and wondered if I was available. I thought, you know what? 
I am available, and I left. A few days later, I got a nasty email from one of the guys who wrote me up, telling me that they didn't like my attitude and that I needed to think about what I wanted. I thought about it, and I realized I didn't want to deal with their crap anymore. So I wrote my resignation letter, went back to the station, gathered my personal effects, and I never went back. I'm sure all the people in that locale would love to know how dysfunctional and ridiculous their station is being. I mean, I get the whole like 40 hours unpaid a month because they're like trying to make sure there's always enough people there. But man, like finding out that your local fire station is so dysfunctional and awful to work at that people would want to just rather up and quit than work there. Finding that out about your local fire station would really help you sleep better at night, wouldn't it? Honestly though, that little tidbit that OP threw in about somebody trying to throw a whole coup for a small town department somewhere, it doesn't surprise me that even in small town politics, somebody's willing to try to overthrow the government. I just think you have any kind of position of power, even if it's a small rinky dink, nobody genuinely cares about it small town political position, you're going to find your local equivalent of that small square boxy mustachioed man that everybody knows in history. You're gonna find that one of your locale that wants that small town position and is willing to throw a coup for it. Power is power. Our next story is stack the pallets four high. I used to work as a merchandiser for a national soda company about 10 years ago. One of the biggest problems we had would occur every holiday when stores had serious sales on soda, like getting four 12 packs for 10 bucks. The problem is that there simply isn't enough room in the back room to store enough product on a really busy holiday like the 4th of July. Our sales reps would order way more stuff than we ever had room for, and then it was up to me on how to Tetris it all into the space for us in the back. The way it should be done is to send multiple orders on days like that as space becomes available. But of course, that means sending drivers to stores multiple times which cost time and gas. I had one store that had a really strict backroom manager, with a no exceptions policy of pallets never being stacked more than three high. On this particular 4th of July, we literally had twice as much product than what would fit. So I call my boss and tell him he needs to send a driver to buy back some of the excess load. He tells me to stack the pallets as high as the forklift will allow me to solve the problem. I remind him at this location I'm only allowed to stack three high. He tells me to figure it out. Cue malicious compliance. I know that the backroom manager will get lava level mad when he sees this, but it's the boss's orders. So I am up to five high when the manager sees it and goes banshee ape crap on me. I shrug and tell him it's my boss's orders. I finish stacking, with one tower now being five high, then start walking out as my shift is now done. The backroom manager tells me if I leave it like that, we can kiss our account with a store goodbye. I shrug and leave. I get a call from my boss 30 minutes later that there's a driver on the way to do buyback, and I need to go back to that store ASAP. I tell them my shift is done for the day and I've already returned the company truck, and I'm on my way home to see some fireworks. It's 8pm at this point. He tells me to turn around and go get it sorted. I tell him the only way I'm going back is if I get double time for the entire day. About 14 hours at that point. Plus a 10% raise. He yells at me that it's never going to happen, so I tell him that me returning to the store is never going to happen. I also tell him that if he changes his mind, he can send an email to me agreeing in writing to my terms. I had other side gigs at the time and wasn't concerned at all about this job. I got an email 30 minutes later from my boss's boss agreeing to those terms. It is immediately followed by a phone call from him apologizing that I'm needed and I need to go back to the store ASAP. My boss's boss also sent my boss who was already at home to help sort the mess out. Hearing him apologize to the backroom manager was gold. All throughout this story, there was never a point that did not execute leverage. Whether it's with the forklift, or with the fact that OP's going home to spend the 4th of July, and they really have no incentive to come back unless they make it really worth their while. And I gotta say, 14 hours at double time plus a 10% raise? I think OP asked for like, just the right amount, like anything more, and they would probably say, you know what, forget it. OP spun the roulette wheel and landed on exactly the number they needed to hit. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. 
Now, if you want to hear another absolutely awesome malicious compliance story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.